Winter is not a season, but an occupation. The trouble with this country is there are too many people going about saying the trouble with this country is. I think perhaps we want a more conscious life. We get sick on too many cookies, but ever so much sicker on no cookies at all. She's not a respectable married woman, but fully a human being. Not individuals, but institutions are the enemies. They insinuate their tyrannies under a hundred guises and pompous names, such as polite society, the family, the church, sound business, the party, the country, the superior white race. You're so earnest about morality that I hate to think how essentially immoral you must be underneath. Witty, trenchant, and a keen observer, Minnesota author Sinclair Lewis could certainly hurl a zinger. But in 23 novels, dozens of short stories, essays, and articles, this Nobel Prize winner did much more. He cast a quizzical eye on American society, challenging us on issues such as women's rights, politics, religion, race, health care, capitalism. <laughs> Sound familiar? And transformed these polemics into imaginative fiction that could cause a chuckle, raise an eyebrow, and touch your heart. And in his two best-known novels, The Urban-Rural Divide is laid bare. In 1920, his breakthrough novel, Main Street, proved a devastating satire of the limitations of small town life. Our heroine, Carol Kennicott, and her stolid husband move from Minneapolis to Gopher Prairie, Minnesota, where her vague dreams and progressive ideals are laid quite bare. When Carol had walked for 32 minutes, she had completely covered the town, east and west, north and south, and she stood on the corner of Main Street and Washington Avenue and despaired. Carol gazed about their bedroom. How could people ever live with things like this? She saw the furniture as a circle of elderly judges, condemning her to death by smothering. The tottering brocade chair squeaked, Joker, Joker, smother her. At dinner, Carol listened to Aunt Bessie and Uncle Whittier and Kennicott trying to determine by dialectics whether the copy of the newspaper which Aunt Bessie wanted to send to her sister in Alberta, ought to have two or four cents postage on it. Carol would have taken it to the drugstore and weighed it, but then she was a dreamer. Well, they were practical people. Aunt Bessie and Uncle Whittier were staggered to learn that Carol, a real tangible person living in Minnesota and married to their own flesh and blood relation, could apparently believe that divorce may not always be immoral that illegitimate children do not bear any special or guaranteed form of curse, that there are ethical authorities outside of the Hebrew Bible, that men have drunk wine yet not died in the gutter, that the capitalistic system of distribution and the Baptist wedding ceremony were not known in the Garden of Eden, that mushrooms are as edible as corned beef hash, that there are ministers of the gospel who accept evolution, that some persons of apparent intelligence and business ability do not vote the Republican ticket straight. That it is not a universal custom to wear scratchy flannels next to the skin in winter. That a violin is not inherently more immoral than a chapel organ. That some poets do not have long hair. Carol reflected that the carving knife might make an excellent dagger with which to kill Uncle Whittier. It would slide in easily. The headlines would be terrible. Blood on the whiteness of the tablecloth might be gorgeous. Readers were certainly meeting a new kind of heroine and a bracing new voice in American fiction. You probably also noticed one of Sinclair Lewis's tricks, using a dazzling list that gives pungency and scope and depth to his writing. Another is the use of freewheeling monologues that bring minor characters vividly to life. Let's eavesdrop on three of these townsfolk from Main Street, and notice that each one has their own gripe about Gopher Prairie, 
economic, moral, and political. On the corner, Carol heard a farmer holding forth. Sure. Of course I was beaten. The shipper and the grocers here wouldn't pay us a decent price for our potatoes, even though folks in the cities were howling for them. So we says, well, we'll get a truck and ship them right down to Minneapolis. But the commission merchants there were in cahoots with the local shipper here. Well, we found we could get higher prices in Chicago, but when we tried to get freight cars, the railroads wouldn't let us have them, even though they had cars standing empty right here in the yards. Gus, that's the way these towns work all the time. They foreclose every mortgage and put in tenant farmers. The newspapers lie to us. The machinery dealers hate to carry us over bad years. And then their daughters put on swell dresses and look at us as if we were a bunch of hobos. Man, I'd like to burn this town. Mrs. Bogart hitched her chair nearer. Her large face, with its disturbing collection of moles and lone black hairs, wrinkled cunningly. She showed her decayed teeth in a reproving smile and in a confidential voice of one who scents stale bedroom scandal, she breathed. Don't you think it's awful the way folks talk in this town? Why, just the other day, I never pay no attention to stories, but I heard it good and straight that Harry Haydock is carrying on with a girl that clerks at a store down in Minneapolis and poor Juanita not knowing anything about it. Though maybe it's the judgment of God because before she married Harry, she acted up with more than one boy. Well, I don't like to say it, maybe I ain't up to date, but just the same, I know there was at least one case where Juanita and a boy well, they were just dreadful. <laughs> oh, and then there's that Ole Jensen, the grocer. He thinks he's so plaguey smart, but I know he made it up to a farmer's wife. And that awful man Bjornstam that does the chores. And Nat Hicks. There was, it seemed, no person in town who was not living a life of shame except Mrs. Bogart. And naturally, she resented it. Bjornstam. Miles Bjornstam, half Yank and half Swede, usually known as that damn lazy big mouth calamity howler that ain't satisfied with the way we do things. <laughs> I'm the town bad man, Mrs. Kennicott. Town atheist, and I suppose I must be an anarchist too. <laughs> Everybody who doesn't love the bankers and the grand old Republican Party is an anarchist. I'm poor, and yet I don't envy the rich enough. I make enough money, and then I sit around and have a smoke and read history. I'm a lone wolf. In fact, Mrs. Kennicott, I'll say that as far as I can make out, the only people in this man's town who do have any brains, real imaginative brains, are you and me and the foreman at the flour mill. He's a socialist, the foreman. Don't tell Lime Cass that. Lime would fire a socialist quicker than he would a horse thief. As the shallow meanness of Gopher Prairie weighs on Carol Kennicott, she yearns for a different life. Listen in this scene as it pivots from political commentary to the deeply personal. In the early autumn, news came that an organizer for the National Nonpartisan League defied the sheriff and announced that he would address a farmer's political meeting. That night, a mob of a hundred businessmen led by the sheriff had taken the organizer from his hotel, ridden him on a fence rail, put him on a freight train, and warned him not to return. The story was threshed out in Dave Dyer's drugstore with Sam Clark, Kennicott, and Carol present. That's the way to treat those fellows. Only they ought to have lynched him, declared Sam, and Kennicott and Dave joined in a proud, you bet. Carol walked out hastily. Through supper time, she knew that her husband was bubbling and would soon boil over. When the baby was abed and they sat composedly on the porch, he experimented. I had a hunch you thought Sam was kind of hard on that fellow they kicked out. All these organizers, yes. A whole lot of the German and squarehead farmers themselves, they're seditious as the devil. Disloyal, non-patriotic, pro-German pacifists, that's what they are. Did this organizer say anything pro-German? They didn't give him a chance. 
So the whole thing was illegal and led by the sheriff. Precisely how do you expect them to obey your law if the officer of the law teaches them to break it? Whenever it comes right down to a question of defending Americanism and our constitutional rights, it's justifiable to set aside ordinary procedure. What editorial did you get that from? <laughs> we do sanctify our efforts to keep them from getting the holy dollars we want for ourselves. The churches have always done it, and the political orators. And I suppose I do it. But you business- Now that'll be about all from you. I stood for your sneering at this town and saying how ugly and dull it is, but one thing I'm not going to stand, my own wife being seditious. The whole thing's right in line with the criticism you've always been making. I might have known you'd oppose any decent, constructive work for the town. You're right. I don't belong to Gopher Prairie. <laughs> that isn't meant to be a condemnation of Gopher Prairie, and it may be a condemnation of me. All right, I don't belong here. And I'm going. I'm not asking permission anymore. I'm simply going. Do you mind telling me, if it isn't too much trouble, how long you're going for? I don't know. Perhaps for a year? Perhaps for a lifetime? I see. Well, of course. I, I'll be tickled to death to sell out my practice and go anywhere you say. Would you like to have me go with you to Paris and study art and wear velveteen pants and a woman's bonnet and live on spaghetti? No, I think we can save you that trouble. You don't quite understand. I am going. I really am. And alone. I've got to find out what my work is. Work? Work? If you had five kids and no hired girl and had to help with the chores and separate the cream like these farmer's wives, then you wouldn't be so discontented. That's what most men and women would say. That's how they would explain all I am and all I want. There have been a good many times when we hadn't a maid, and I did all the housework, and cared for Hugh, and went to Red Cross, and did it all very efficiently. I'm a good cook and a good sweeper, and you don't dare say I'm not. No, but you're... was I more happy when I was drudging? I was not. It's work, but it's not my work. I can run an office, or a library, or nurse, and teach children. But solitary dishwashing isn't enough to satisfy me, or many other women. We're going to chuck it. We're going to wash in my machinery and come out and play with you men in the offices and clubs and politics. Of course, a little thing like your son makes no difference. Yes, all the difference. That's why I'm going to take him with me. Suppose I refuse. You won't. <sighs> Carrie, what the devil is it you want, anyway? Oh, conversation. No, it's much more than that. I think it's a greatness of life. A refusal to be content with even the healthiest mud. Don't you know that nobody ever solved the problem by running away from it? Perhaps. Only I choose to make my own definition of running away. Do you realize how big a world there is beyond this gopher prairie? And even if I am cowardly and run away, go ahead, call it cowardly. Call me anything you want to. I've been ruled too long by the fear of being called things. I'm going away to be quiet and think. I'm, I'm going. I have a right to my own life. So have I to mine. Well? I have a right to my life. And you're it. You're my life. You've made yourself so. I I'm damned if I'll agree to all your freak notions. This off to Bohemia and express yourself and free love and live your own life stuff. You have a right to me if you can keep me. Can you? For a month, they discussed it. They hurt each other very much, and sometimes they were close to weeping. Kennicott never consented definitely. At most, he agreed to a public theory that she was going to take a short trip and see what the East was like in wartime. She set out for Washington in October, just before the war ended. It took a while for folks in Sinclair Lewis's own hometown of Sauk Center, Minnesota to cozy up to Main Street's takedown of rural life. But while the city slickers were busy laughing up their sleeves at these hicks, Lewis was busy writing his next bestseller. Babbitt satirized the self-satisfied middle-class, middle-brow, middle-aged that populated America's booming cities. Dusty Gopher Prairie is now replaced by the fictitious city of Zenith, 
which bears more than a passing resemblance to a pair of Twin Cities that you might recognize. But first, let's meet our new hero. To George F. Babbitt, as to most prosperous citizens of Zenith, his motor car was poetry and tragedy, love and heroism. The office was his pirate ship, but his car was his perilous excursion ashore. Babbitt was an average father. He was affectionate, bullying, opinionated, ignorant, and rather wistful. Like most parents, he enjoyed the game of waiting till the victim was clearly wrong, then virtuously pouncing. Babbitt loved his mother, and sometimes he rather liked her. Being a man given to oratory and high principles, Babbitt enjoyed the sound of his own vocabulary and the warmth of his own virtue. Babbitt was uncomfortable with his new secretary. What Miss Havstad's given name was, no one in the office ever knew. It seemed improbable that she had a given name, a lover, a powder puff, or a digestion. Babbitt enjoyed three kinds of film, pretty bathing girls with bare legs, policemen or cowboys and an industrious shooting of revolvers, and funny fat men who ate spaghetti. <laughs> oh. Babbitt stopped smoking at least once a month. He went through with it like the solid citizen he was, admitted the evils of tobacco, courageously made resolves, laid out plans to check the vice, tapered off his allowance of cigars, and expounded the pleasures of virtuousness to everyone he met. He did everything, in fact except stop smoking. Babbitt's march to greatness was not without disastrous stumbling. The ironic comedy of Babbitt tumbles forward as we're introduced to Babbitt's world, his work, his social life, his religious views, even his bedroom. Babbitt's bedroom displayed a modest and pleasant color scheme after one of the best standard designs. The walls were gray, the woodwork white, the rug a serene blue, and very much like mahogany was the furniture. The bureau with its great clear mirror, Mrs. Babbitt's dressing table with toilet articles of almost solid silver. The plain twin beds, between them a small table holding a standard electric bedside lamp, a glass, for water, and a standard bedside book with colorful illustrations. What particular book it was cannot be ascertained, as no one had ever opened it. The mattresses were firm, but not hard, triumphant modern mattresses, which had cost a great deal of money. The hot water radiator was of exactly the proper scientific surface for the cubic contents of the room. The windows were large and easily opened. It was a masterpiece among bedrooms, right out of cheerful modern houses for medium incomes. Only it had nothing to do with the Babbitts, nor with anyone else. If people had ever lived and loved here, read thrillers at midnight, and lain in in beautiful indolence on a Sunday morning, there were no signs of it. It had the air of being a very good room, in a very good hotel. One expected the chambermaid to come in and make it ready for people who would stay but one night, go without looking back, and never think of it again. Every second house in Floral Heights had a bedroom exactly like this. In fact, there was but one thing wrong with the Babbitt house. It was not a home. As Babbitt approached the office, he walked faster and faster, muttering, guess better hustle. All about him, the city was hustling, for hustling's sake. Men in motors were hustling to pass one another in the hustling traffic. Men were hustling to catch trolleys with another trolley a minute behind, and to leap from the trolleys, to gallop across the sidewalk, to hurl themselves into buildings, and to hustling express elevators. Men in dairy lunches were hustling to gulp down the food which cooks had hustled to fry. Men in barbershops were snapping, just save me once over, gotta hustle. 
Men were feverishly getting rid of visitors and offices adorned with the signs, This is my busy day, and the Lord created the world in six days. You can spiel all you got to say in six minutes. Men who had made 5,000 year before last and 10,000 last year were urging on nerve-yelping bodies and parched brains so that they might make 20,000 this year. And the men who had broken down immediately after making their $20,000 were hustling to catch trains to hustle through the vacations which the hustling doctors had ordered. Among them, Babbitt hustled back to his office to sit down with nothing much to do except see that the staff looked as though they were hustling. If you had asked Babbitt what his religion was, he would have answered in sonorous Boosters Club rhetoric, my religion is to serve my fellow men, to honor my brother as myself, and to do my bit to make life happier for one and all. If you had pressed him for more detail, he would have announced, I'm a member of the Presbyterian Church, and naturally I accept its doctrines. If you had been so brutal as to go on, he would have protested, there's no use discussing and arguing about religion. It just stirs up bad feeling. Babbitt's clubs and associations were food comfortable to his spirit. Of a decent man in Zenith, it was required he should belong to one, preferably two or three, of the innumerous lodges and prosperity-boosting lunch clubs, to the Rotarians, the Kiwanis, or the Boosters, to the Oddfellows, Moose, Masons, Redmen, Woodmen, Owls, Eagles, Maccabee, Knights of Pythias, Knights of Columbus, and other secret orders characterized by a high degree of hardiness, sound morals, and reverence for the Constitution. There were four reasons for joining these orders. It was the thing to do. It was good for business, since Lodge Brothers frequently became customers. It gave such unctuous honorifics as High Worthy Recording Scribe and Grand Hugao to add to the commonplace distinctions of Colonel, Judge, and Professor. And it permitted the swaddled American husband to stay away from home for one evening a week. The lodge was his piazza, his pavement cafe. He could shoot pool and talk man talk and be obscene and valiant. <laughs> You can just feel the energy in Sinclair Lewis's writing as he skewers each institution, and he'll merrily go out of his way just to make a comic point. Here's one. George Babbitt and his wife Myra, both sheep-like followers of mainstream fads, attend a presentation by a renowned New Age personality. Mrs. Opal Emerson Mudge the field lecturer for the American New Thought League, was speaking on cultivating the sun spirit before the League of Higher Illumination. Here were gathered 65 women and 10 men. In the flesh, Mrs. Opal Emerson Mudge fell somewhat short of a prophetic aspect. She was pony-built and plump, with the face of a haughty Pekingese, a button of a nose, and arms so short that despite her most indignant efforts, she could not clasp her hands in front of her as she sat on the platform waiting. Mrs. Mudge was introduced by the president of the League of Higher Illumination, an oldish young woman with a yearning voice, white spats, and a mustache. If Mrs. Mudge was rather pudgier than one would like one's swamis, yogis, seers, and initiates, yet her voice had a real professional note. It was refined and optimistic. It was overpoweringly calm. It flowed on relentlessly without one comma till Babbitt was hypnotized. There are those who have seen the rim and outer seeming of the logos. There are those who have glimpsed and in enthusiasm possessed themselves of some segment and portion of the logos. There are those who thus flicked but not penetrated and radioactivated by the diamonds go always to and fro assertative that they possess and all possess of the logos and the metaphigus occurs. But by this word, I bring you the concept. I enlarge for those that are not utter and not even inceptive and that holiness is in its definitive essence always, always, always. It went on for about an hour and seven minutes. But just as in Main Street, Sinclair Lewis turns from social commentary to something deeply personal 
as Babbitt's inevitable midlife crisis shatters. Listen for the insights on marital relationships and then the brilliant, surreal description of his surroundings. So as the ambulance drove up to St. Mary's Hospital with the nurses already laying out instruments for an operation to save Myra's life, it was she who consoled Babbitt and kissed the place to make it well. And though he tried to be gruff and mature, he yielded to her and was glad to be babied. The ambulance whirled under the hooded carriage entrance of the hospital, and instantly Babbitt was reduced to a zero in the nightmare succession of cork-floored halls. Endless doors opened to old women sitting up in bed, an elevator, the anesthetizing room, a young intern contemptuous of husbands. He was permitted to kiss his wife. He saw a thin, dark nurse fit the cone over her mouth and nose. He stiffened at a sweet and treacherous odor. Then he was driven out, and in a laboratory he sat dazed, longing to see her once again, to insist that he had always loved her, had never for a second loved anybody else or, or looked at anybody else. In the laboratory he was conscious only of a decayed object preserved in a bottle of yellowing alcohol. It made him very sick, but he could not take his eyes from it. To escape it, he opened the door to the right, hoping to find a sane and business-like office. He realized that he was looking into the operating room. In one glance, he saw Dr. Dilling, strange in white gown and bandaged head, bending over the steel table. Then nurses holding basins and cotton sponges, and a swathed thing, just a lifeless chin and a mound of white in the midst of which was a square of sallow flesh with a gash a little bloody at the edges, protruding from the gash a cluster of forceps like clinging parasites. Babbitt shut the door with haste, and as he crouched in the laboratory, he swore faith to his wife, to Zenith, to business efficiency, to the Boosters Club, to every faith of the clan of good fellows. Thus it came to Babbitt merely to run away was folly, because he could never run away from himself. And Sinclair Lewis could never let America run away from itself. His fierce indignation, keen sense of human folly, and deep yearning for a better tomorrow keep his stories fresh and vibrant, even if looking in the mirror makes us laugh and cringe simultaneously. Well, let's close with this magnificent literary elegy that, to me at least, really cements Sinclair Lewis as a master of the modern novel and as an acute commentator on American society. At the end of another very typical day, George F. Babbitt prepares for bed and Lewis pulls back the narrative camera to reveal in broad panorama and minute detail the vast humanity in the city of Zenith. At that moment in the city of Zenith, Horace Updike was making love to Lucille McKelvey in her mauve dressing room on Royal Ridge after their return from a lecture by an eminent English novelist. And at that moment in Zenith, a cocaine runner and a prostitute were drinking cocktails in Healy Hansen's saloon on Front Street. Since national prohibition was now in force, and since Zenith was notoriously law-abiding, they were compelled to keep the cocktails innocent by drinking them out of teacups. The lady threw her cup at the cocaine runner's head. He worked his revolver out of the pocket in his sleeve and casually murdered her. At that moment in Zenith, two men sat in a laboratory. For 37 hours now, they had been working on a report of their investigations of synthetic rubber. At that moment in Zenith, there was a conference of four union officials as to whether the 12,000 coal miners within 100 miles of the city should strike. Of these men, one resembled a testy and prosperous grocer, one a Yankee carpenter, one a soda clerk, and one a Russian Jewish actor. At that moment, the steel and cement town which composed the factory of the Polmore Tractor Company of Zenith was running on night shift to fill an order of tractors for the Polish army. It hummed like a million bees, glared through its wide windows like a volcano. Along the high wire fences, searchlights played on cinder-lined yards, switch tracks, 
and armed guards on patrol. At that moment, a GAR veteran was dying. He had come from the Civil War straight to a farm which, though it was officially within the city limits of Zenith, was primitive as the backwoods. He had never ridden in a motor car, never seen a bathtub, never read any book save the Bible, and he believed that the earth is flat, that the English are the ten lost tribes of Israel, and that the United States is a democracy. At that moment in Zenith, Jake Offutt, the politician, and Henry T. Thompson were in conference. Offutt suggested, The thing to do is to get your fool son-in-law Babbitt to put it over. He's one of those patriotic guys, and I do love to buy respectability. Wonder how long we can keep it up, Hank. We're safe as long as the good little boys like George Babbitt think you and me are rugged patriots. There's swell pickings for an honest politician here, Hank. At that moment in Zenith, 340 or 50,000 ordinary people were asleep, a vast, unpenetrated shadow. In the slum beyond the railroad tracks, a young man who for six months had sought work turned on the gas and killed himself and his wife. At that moment, Lloyd Malum, the poet, owner of the Hafiz bookshop, was finishing a rondo to show how diverting was life amid the feuds of medieval Florence, but how dull it was in so obvious a place as Zenith. And at that moment, George F. Babbitt turned ponderously in bed. Instantly, he was in the magic dream. He was somewhere among unknown people who laughed at him. He slipped away, ran down the paths of a midnight garden, and at the gate the fairy child was waiting. Her dear and tranquil hand caressed his cheek. He was gallant and wise and well-beloved. Warm ivory were her arms, and beyond perilous moors the brave sea glittered. <laughs>